Hey, I want to welcome you this morning, whether you're here uh, live or right here in the sanctuary or you're watching live streaming or whether you're watching from the uh, third space. Well, there's lots of different places you can be a part of our church from, and we love that everybody's part that's, uh, that's, that's uh, uh, in tune with this. Here we go. We're in a series. Uh, we took a week off, but we're back into the series on the dangers of drifting. And the first week, I think we started the first week of October, and I talked to you about the story of uh, Solomon. If you missed that, I, I would hope that you would go back. And we talked that Sunday about this personal story about Solomon, who was the smartest, wisest, richest, slickest, most in control guy that has ever lived. And yet, at a point in his life, he started to drift away from God in his relationship to God. And, 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 and I, I said that Sunday, and I really mean this, that if, if, if he missed it, then I have the potential to miss it. And if he missed it, you have the potential to miss it. We came back the next week and uh, we went to Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1 that says, hey, listen, don't, the writer of Hebrews says, don't drift. And the way you don't drift is you got to pay attention. And that Sunday we just came out and we said, okay, the way you pay attention is you got to have guardrails. Did anybody notice that we put the guardrail right up front today? What's that thing doing in here? If you've missed a couple of Sundays, you're going, guardrail? What's a guardrail? Well, I'm glad you asked what a guardrail is, because I want to give you the, the road definition of a guardrail is this. It's not in your notes, but it says this. A guardrail is a system designed to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous areas. Now, I've had a bunch of people come and tell me that they've actually hit a guardrail in their life. I've hit one when I was in college. How many of you have ever, with your car, you've hit a guardrail? Would you just raise your hand? See, that's an amazing number of people. There's, a, there's a, probably 20 people to have. So we took that and we said, okay, if that's what a guardrail is out on the road, what would it look like to have some guardrails in our personal lives? And so we came up with a definition. We said this, and we put this is in your notes, and it's coming up on the screen as well. We said a guardrail is a standard of behavior. It's something that you choose for yourself. It's a personal standard behavior. This is the way I'm going to live my life personal standard behavior that becomes a matter of conscience. The idea being that if you were to choose, you, if you choose behaviors for yourself, that you, it would keep you five yards back from disaster. And, and you say, well, what do you mean by disaster, Craig? I, I mean financial disaster, friendship disaster, moral, whatever disaster you can think of. And as you recognize that there's lines out there that, hey, if you, if you cross them, then there's going to be consequences on the other side of that. That once I cross them, then I'm going to pay a penalty. That once I cross them, I'm going to hurt the people that I love the most. That, that as you recognize that there is those lines in your life, that you would actually back up from that line, that you would put a guardrail down in your life, and that guardrail, watch this, uh, cameras, if you watch this, and you'll just kind of uh, get a little bit bigger screen and kind of show the whole thing across here. They hate when I call camera shots, but here we go calling the camera shot here, that you put a guardrail up in your life. Now watch this. This is really important to me that watch this. The edge back here is, is the danger area. This is where you go flying off the cliff. And so you back it up five feet and you put a guardrail there so that if you hit a guardrail, something lights up in your life and you don't have to go off the edge back over here. Everybody with me in that? Okay, we'll go over it one more time. <laughs> Come on, that you put a guardrail up there, and it keeps you from going over the edge. It's not right on the edge. It's actually about five feet from the edge. And this would be, that this guardrail would be some, become so clear in your life that it would, if you hit the guardrail, it would light up your, there was red flags that would go off. If you actually bumped into a guardrail that you would establish. Now, the temptation for our lives is, is we want to live as close as we can to the edge of disaster. Financially, sometimes people live right on the edge. They borrow as much as they can borrow. I just want to tell you financially, if you borrowed as much as you can borrow and the banks look at you and going, you can't borrow anymore, you are living right on the edge. And that's a real danger. Anybody say amen to that? Amen. Come on, if morally you're living right on the edge, that's dangerous. But the wise person is the person that says, you know what? I'm not going to live on the edge of disaster. I'm going to take a step back and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put down some guardrails in my life. Now, today I want to talk to you about what I think is the most important area to have guardrails. This is the most, in this area today is the area that we most need guard more than any other area, because here's what you find. You find, man, 
I find that there's more resistance to what I'm talking about today. In fact, I got to tell you what happened after the first service. I went out and I stood by the front door and there were about a quarter of the people that usually come and see me, about a quarter of the people that I know what happened. Uh, the three quarters of the people went around the other way going, I'm not going to talk to him. <laughs> I get that. I, you know what I feel like today? I feel like an Old Testament prophet. Yeah, if you read the Old Testament prophets, you, you realize that they're yelling and screaming and they're waving their hands going, don't go down that well-worn path. Because if you go down that path, you are headed for disaster. And the prophets are going, stop, stop, don't go that way. And the people just keep on walking right by them like they're not even there. And, 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 and listen... I know that the average person here today is going to go, well, yeah, but Craig, that's kind of what we'd, we'd expect you to say that. We expect preachers to say what you're saying today. And just, you know, a lot of people just keep on living the way that they're living. But if we would begin to establish some guardrails, especially in this area that we're talk, I'm talking about today, then it would impact not only our lives, but it would impact the lives of the people that we love the most. And, and, and if, if we would just take a step back and establish some personal standards of behavior that would trip our conscience, that would light up our conscience when we hit the guardrail before we get off the cliff, I, I, it, it would make such a huge difference in our lives. So, so, so today I want to talk to you about sexual intimacy, if you haven't realized that. And, and I, I, I got to tell you, if you've ever heard me study, I'm going to stutter twice as much today than I usually do, and I usually don't talk very well. But I'm telling you today, when I talk about sexual intimacy, I'm talking about this is a place where we need a guardrail that's like steel reinforced. Anybody say amen to that? And the reason is this, because unlike in every other area of your life that I'm talking on, that you got to have a guardrail here, and you got to have a guardrail in this area. You know what? Truthfully, you can fully recover from a lot of those other areas. But, but in the area of sexual intimacy, sexual disaster is almost impossible to fully recover from. Because sex is not just physical. I, I know what our culture says. Our culture says sex is just physical. And I'm telling you, it's way deeper than that. And when a person crosses certain lines for their desire for personal physical intimacy, when a person crosses certain lines, when it comes to their sexuality, there are things that, that people carry with them for the rest of their lives. And, and we know that. We don't talk about it very much because I'm telling you right now, if you think I'm having fun talking about this today, you're wrong. But we live in a culture that just says, hey, sex is just physical, and we know better than that. If there's any area of our lives where we need to have guardrails, I'm convinced today that this today is the area, because the damage that done, the damage will follow us, the, the, the memories follow us, the guilt follows us, and it goes on and on. And so today, we're, we're going to look at a, a passage of Scripture, three verses, and it seems kind of extreme that Paul would say this, but as you think about your past, the truth is, we would... We would be better off if we would take these three simple verses and apply them to our life and got serious about this. I'm telling you, it would change our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 is where we're going to start. We're going to read 18, 19, and 20. Here's verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 says, so run away. <laughs> That's pretty graphic, isn't it? Run away from sexual sin. It doesn't say be careful. It doesn't say get as close as you can to the line and peer over the edge. Paul says run away. When it comes to sexual sin, I mean, come on, can it get clearer than this? You got to run away. Now, here's the thing I know about you. If you're married and you're here, this is what you want from your husband. This is what you want your wife to do. This is, if you have kids, this is what you want your kids to do. And yet, this is the thing that when we think about our lives, for me, listen, you're not sure you want to do this. I mean, you might be sitting here going, well, I'm sure glad my spouse is here to hear this, or I'm sure glad my kids. And if they're not here, you're going, how can I get my kids to listen to this? Come on, some of you are already thinking about that. Because when I look at everybody else's life around me, I, I mean, what could be clearer than that? They got to know. We know the implications of, of, of stepping over the line into sexual sin. So, so, so we would say to people that we care about, run away from sexual sin. But when it comes to you, come on, think about this with me. You don't run. You know what we do? We flirt. 
we ask, well, I'm not even sure what sexual sin is. And see, here's what's crazy about this. Our culture, if you want to fill the lines in in your notes, here's a place for you to fill a couple lines in. Our culture baits us to the edge of disaster, and then our culture mocks us when we step over. I mean, I think all of us could agree today. Come on, can we not all agree that, that, that pregnancy in young girls, teenage girls, that's a, man, that, that's not a good thing. Anybody with me on that? Amen. And yet, come on, listen to me. Isn't it true that our culture baits young girls in the way that they market? Or when some guy finally falls over the cliff and gets addicted to pornography, it's like everybody that, that knows about it goes, oh, that's just, that's just, what's wrong with him? Well, he just took the bait because every place we go, we're being baited to the edge. Come on, let's be honest about this. We entertain ourselves in TV shows and movies with affairs. Uh -uh. And you're not going to argue with me today. You're just going to look like, I can't believe you brought that up. But it's true, isn't it? Almost every show you watch, there's somebody who's not married who's, who's getting into bed together. Right? And, and, and we're all going to go, yeah, that's bad. That's bad. And, and we, yeah, I can't believe that they would do something like that. And, and, and then we're so surprised when somebody that we know has an affair. We just kind of look at them and go, what's wrong with you? Well, what's wrong with them is they've been baited to the edge. And once they've gone over the edge, we just kind of chastise them. I mean, when was the last time you saw a romance scene on TV or at a movie that was with a married couple? <laughs> How gross is that? <laughs> you know, I don't want to, I don't want to say, I mean, we're, but this is what culture does. We're baited to the edge of moral disaster. And then when somebody steps across, we instantly chastise them and look down on them. So what do you, you know what we need today? Because our culture is not going to change. And how, how many of you would raise your hand today and go, well, I think culture is going to get better. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. The culture is not. So you know what we need? We need guardrails. We need to decide, we need to put a guardrail down in this area of our life and go, listen, this is as close as I get to the edge. And when I bump up against that guardrail, remember a guardrail is a personal standard of behavior. When I bump up against that guardrail, uh, that personal standard of behavior, and, and I start to feel a little bit guilty and those warning lights go off, I'm going to go, God, I, I'm sorry. You don't even have to wait till Sunday to say, God, I'm sorry. Did anybody know that? And, 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 and Craig, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a big deal out of something that's five yards away from disaster so that I never get close to coming to the edge. See, that is what a guardrail is supposed to do. Now, if you're a Christian, there's even a greater incentive for us to run from sexual sin. There's a greater incentive for us to create these guardrails. Here's what Paul goes on to say. Chapter 6, verse 19. You should know... That your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. Listen to me, I want to make sure you know this. This is great news. That the Holy Spirit, when you come to the point where when the choir was singing that song, wasn't there something that just took you back to that time where you said yes to Jesus Christ and you said, Jesus, what you did on the cross, you paid for my sins. I should have been the ones. Remember that song with his arms stretched out? I should have had my arms stretched out. I should have died for my sins. But Jesus, you died for my sins. I'm so grateful. And, and, and listen, when you said, Jesus, I want to follow you for the rest of my life from this point on, listen to me, I want to tell you what happened. God's spirit, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you. Amen. Come on, that ought to, we ought to dance about that. We ought to get excited about that. That's a good thing. Listen to the implication. Paul says, the end of verse 19, so you do not belong, because the Holy Spirit lives in you, he, you do not belong to yourselves. Your body doesn't just belong to you because God moved into your body. Verse 20, you are bought at a price. The implication as you read the whole passage put together is that when Jesus Christ came into the world, he died for your sins. He purchased you. You have been purchased. You have been freed from the power of sin in your life. And now you're no longer a slave to sin. You don't, you don't have to do what your, your body desires and tells you to do because your body is now under the authority of a new master. And I just want to stop and say, hallelujah, I love that verse. 
And so consequently, because of that, Paul now says, you're not your own. You have been purchased and specifically purchased from the power of sin. Power of sin has no longer has its domination over you. Therefore, because of that implication, honor God with your bod. <laughs> Everybody's going, what? Does it say that? Well, yeah, honor God with your bodies. And the whole context of the discussion that Paul is doing, he's talking about sexual sin. He started the conversation saying, run away from sexual sin. So Paul comes along and says, here's what I want you to do with your body. If you have any questions, if it's unclear, if you're trying to figure this out, if you're trying to make a decision, here's kind of the litmus test. He says, honor God with your body. That ought to be the litmus test. Honor God with your body. Honor God with your body. Come on, say that with me. Honor God with your body. One more time. Honor God with your body. And, and you go, well, I don't know what you mean by that. Well, here it is on your notes. First page right here. If it's dishonoring to God, don't do it with your body. If it's dishonoring to God, don't take your body there. If it's dishonoring to God, don't look at it. If it's dishonoring to God, don't think about it. Decide every morning, God, my body belongs to you. And I want to I live my life in such a way that everything I do with this bod honors you. And God says, well, if that's the case, then when it comes to sexual sin, you got to run away from sexual sin, not flirt, not get as close as you can to the edge, run away. Which means practically speaking, you've got to establish some guardrails because if you live on the edge and you you happen to step over the edge, it'll lead to catastrophe. But if you put up some guardrails up, you're going to bump into those guardrails. And hey, even, even if your conscience lights up, there are going to be very few consequences. Now, the whole reason I'm, I'm bringing this up is because I want to get to some guardrails. And I'm going to do that in just a moment. I'm going to give you some specific guardrails. But here's what I want to say to people. I want to address this issue. Some people that are sitting here today, because I think there'll be a lot of people that sit here and listen to this and go, oh, Craig, you are just so extreme that nobody does that. First of all, you're wrong. Lots of people have guardrails up in this area that I'm talking about. But if your whole take on what I'm about to say on guardrails is, Craig, that's just two extremes, then I want to say, I want to have you think about two things. One is I want you to think about the person that if you're single and you're sitting here, I want you to think about the person you're going to marry one day. And I want you to think about, if you don't have kids, I want you to think about your kids that either you have or you don't have, but I want you to think about your kids. And if there's, if there's what you want for your spouse and what you want for your kids, if that's different than what you want for yourself then see, I think you ought to look in the mirror and I think you've got to ask yourself why. Why is it that I want my kids to act this way? Why is it that I want the person I'm married to or I'm going to get married to? I want them to act this way, but I don't want to take this seriously myself. But, but, But here's another thing I want you to think about. As we go through this list of guardrails, Let's just say that at the end of the message, you look at me and go, no, nah, I, I, I don't want to do that. that and, and, and you just live however you want to live. And let's just kind of use our imaginations. Let's kind of move ahead two or three years down the line. And you find yourself right on the edge of sexual disaster. And you're thinking, you know, I can't believe I'm in the middle of this, of this drama in my sexual life. And here's my question for you. If two or three years from now, you found yourself dealing from the consequences of the fact that today you didn't put up some guardrails. And now, two or three years from now, you're in the middle of that drama. Here's my question. Do you think that you'll pray? Do you think you'll say, God, please don't let me be pregnant, or God, please don't let her find out, or God, if you'll get me through this, I'll go to church every Sunday, all three services, 8, 9, 30, and 11 o'clock. I'll go to every one of them. Do you think that in the midst of all that drama in your life sexually, that you would cry out to God? And let me just answer the question for you. It's a rhetorical question. Absolutely you will. You'll, you'll go, God, if, if you're there, help me. And here's what God is going to whisper to you. He'll go, hey, do you remember that time two or three years ago? We, we talked about guardrails. Do you remember that? And remember the whole time that, that Craig was up there preaching that you sat there thinking nobody does that. 
And the whole time Craig's preaching, you're thinking, well, that's, you know, I, I, I'd want my wife to do that, or I want my kids to do that, but, 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 but that's too extreme for me. And God would say, do you, do you remember that? Here's my point. This is your wake-up call. This is that opportunity that God is giving you now that two or three years from now, he's going to remind you of and go, do you remember when you just said, nah, not, not for me? Hey, now's the time to do something. And I promise you this, and I said this last week or maybe two weeks ago, what I'm going to go through very quickly in giving you these guardrails, if you say, yeah, you know what, I buy into that, and you establish some guardrails in your life of sexual morality, I promise you, you will never regret these guardrails. Amen? And these are not in the Bible. You say, well, Craig, where'd you get these from? I made these up. It's true. I made these up from the many conversations I've had over the last 30 years of ministry, uh, of, of crying with people over the telephone, of, of sitting in front of people who are going through heartbreaking circumstances. And I ha I've come to the conclusion that in this culture that is so dangerous for you and me morally, that these things that I'm not, these, six, these guardrails that I'm about to give you, these are not extreme at all. This is how you ought to run from sexual sin in our culture, that this ought to be the standing operating, operating procedure. And I'm going to talk to two groups of people. I'm going to talk to married people. As I talk to married people, single people, you can just make a list of, 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 of something else. And then I'm going to switch gears, and I'm going to move from married people. I'm going to talk to single people. But I first want to address married people. All the married people said amen. amen. All right, here we go. You didn't know what you're saying amen to. Here we go. <laughs> Guardrail number one, don't travel, and I have these in your notes, don't travel alone with members of the opposite sex. Just decide if you're married, I don't travel alone with, men, with somebody of the opposite sex. About six years ago, there was a, a church conference that I wanted to go down by the airport, and I got a group of people, leaders together from our church. I think there was five or six of us that were getting ready to go down there. And uh, the night before, three of the people, uh, everybody but me and somebody else decided they, they weren't going to go for whatever reason. And so uh, the night before... Uh, they called up, said, Craig, we can't go. And, and it left me and a female pastor. We were the only ones going down to this conference. And so I called Pastor Katie up and I said, Katie, it's just you and me going to the conference. And I didn't have to say any more than that. I mean, that's all I said is you and I are the only ones that are going. And, 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 and I, I just want you to know, the people that I work with, they understand that, that I don't care how far you have to go. I don't care how much gas it's going to cost. Don't, my staff knows this, don't travel alone with, members of, alone with members of the opposite sex. It's just a standard of your organization. And you ought to applaud the fact that this is an organization that has leaders that stand up and say, this is where we draw the line. In our culture, they would think it's silly to drive 30 miles away, two separate cars, but you know what? That's just the standard that we have. Standard operating procedure at OVCN for our leaders, for our pastors, is, is married people who are serious about maintaining margin morally don't travel alone with members of the opposite sex. And everybody said, amen, that's good. Just decide. Listen, for you. And I, and I want you to know, Katie looked at me and said, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll travel alone. And she just knew. Just decide for you today. Listen, here's a guardrail in my life. I'm just not going to travel alone with members of the the opposite sex. Number two, and, and I know what you're saying, Craig, is it a sin? No, it's not a sin, but it's a guardrail. It keeps me back five feet away from where disaster is. Amen? All right. Because I know somebody's going to get up here and go, well, you think that's a sin? No. Everybody with me? I'm going to move on. I only have time to, i got to keep moving. Here we go. Number two, second guardrail. Don't eat, similar, don't eat alone with members of the opposite sex. Affairs begin right here. You want to have dinner. You want to have coffee. And that became a lunch, that became another dinner, and that became let's work late. Come on, let's just decide I don't eat alone with members of the opposite sex. It ought to be a guardrail in our life. And I know what you're doing. You're sitting there going, oh, Craig, that, that sounds so extreme. Well, guardrails are a little bit extreme. Guardrails are always back from the safeties, in the safety zone. And that's the point of a guardrail. And if you find yourself in a situation where you were surprised 
by the fact that somebody's there and you're having to eat alone with members of the, you just call up your spouse. This happened to me uh, uh, three, four years ago. And I, I went, I was going to meet a couple from our church and they wanted to talk about how they could get involved with OVCN. I said, great, I'll meet with you. We went and met at a restaurant. When I got there, uh, 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 the wife said, hey, my husband's running about half an hour late. I said, that's not a problem. I said, let me call my wife. I called Robin up. I said, hey, I just want you to know, I'm sitting here with da da da, explaining the situation. I'm at this restaurant sat down, waited for her husband. We had a great time. You can get around. You, you can do stuff where you are, 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 are protecting yourself, but here's the guardrail. Don't eat alone with members of the opposite sex. Amen? <laughs> a lot fewer people said amen to that. Did you notice that? Whew. Man, come on. I told you. Did I tell you very few people wanted to shake my hand after the first service? <laughs> Number three, don't. <laughs> I love this one. Don't, are you going to put it up? There we go. Don't hire cute members of the opposite sex just because you want to help them. <laughs> now, let me explain what I mean by that. I, I, some people are kind of snickering and laughing, but come on, some of you have been there. And here's my fear. Some of you are there. And some of you, your spouse had to, has looked at you and said, I'm not comfortable with you working with that person. And you've looked at, yeah, but they really needed the job. I, they, they needed me to help them out. And your spouse was thinking, well, don't, why don't they find somebody ugly that needs that job, right? I mean, you think that. And I'm just telling you right now, don't hire cute people just because you're trying to help them out. Now, listen, we should always want to help people out. That's, that's part of who we are as followers of Christ. But come on, don't deceive yourself. Don't hire cute people just because they need your help. Get them help, but don't hire them. I'm not even going to say amen to that because I think I'd get about three people on that one. Here, number four, fourth guardrail. Don't confide in, don't counsel with members of the opposite sex. Just don't. This is huge. Somebody says to you, well, nobody's ever listened to me like you listen. Really? No one has ever understood me. Like, I mean, good grief. If this was a plot in a movie, come on, wouldn't we all know where the movie's headed, right? We knew what was going to come next. But some of you say, well, Craig, they need me. Time out. No, they don't need you. They need my help. No, they don't. Well, Craig, that doesn't sound very compassionate. No, this is about the most compassionate thing I could say. It shows compassion to your marriage and shows compassion to their future. Do not confide in, do not counsel with, do not confide in, do not counsel with. Do you need me to say it again? In fact, you say it with me. Do not confide in, do not counsel with members of the opposite sex. I'm talking to married people here. It is dangerous when your emotional world gets tangled up in their emotional world. You have now crossed an invisible line, a dangerous line in terms of intimacy because intimacy which is really what we all want I, it's not really sex and, and I know some people would argue and say no it's just sex pretty much but no see you don't it's because you don't know yourself but what you really want is you want that closeness you want that intimacy and intimacy does not begin with the physical intimacy begins with the emotional that's why this that I'm talking about is so dangerous and so the most compassionate thing that you can do for you, for your marriage, and for your kids is to refuse to be the shoulder that that other person, that single person leans on and that they cry on. Number five, fifth guardrail. This is huge, married people. When you feel your heart drifting towards somebody specifically, you need to tell somebody else. Should I tell my spouse? Well, not right now. Later on, but not now. But there needs to be somebody in your life. This is why we're so, so huge on small groups in our church is because you'll be put with people that you begin to trust, that you'll be able to go to, somebody that you can say, this is, it's getting awkward for me. It's getting uncomfortable. I, but I want you to know, and, and this is not a large group, this is just like one or two people you go to and say, this person at work, it, that, you got to help me. And you say, Craig, is that necessary? Yes. Is that a little bit extreme? No. Because you'll never, ever regret this. Number six, guardrail number six, last one for married people. Your spouse needs to know where your guardrails are so that they can call you on it. And your spouse needs to be comfortable with where your guardrails. Can't you see the conversations of married people on the way home today? <laughs> 
I mean, that's a little bit funny, but I want to tell you what I've been praying for all week. I've been praying for married people, whether it's today or tonight or tomorrow, that you would have these sit down, come to Jesus, honest, hey, this is where my guardrails are, and I just want you to know I'm going to honor you with this. In fact, some of your spouses have, have, have been going, you know, I, I've been trying to tell them. I've been talking to them. But, because you already had this conversation, and God is trying to use your spouse to protect you. And this needs to be a conversation among, among married people. Listen to me. I need to know where my wife's guardrails are. My wife, Robin, needs to know where mine are. Your spouse needs to know where your guardrails are, where the guardrails are, because here's the deal. See, if you decide, I'm not going to have a meal alone with an unmarried person, then one day you just do it anyways, and the whole time you're having that meal, the, the, the lights, the conscience uh, lights are just going off. The flags are going off. And you're going, you idiot, what are you doing here? You're going to feel bad. But here's the great thing about the guardrail is you're going to feel bad about it. But watch this. You haven't gone off the edge. Amen? Amen. See, it's put back far enough. The guardrail is put back far enough off the edge that it lights up your conscience when it does that, that keeps you from, from going over into disaster. All right, all the married people, you can take a break. Let me talk to single people. Single people, first slide, here we go. Just gouge your eyes out with a spoon. That ought to take care of it right there. <laughs> Kidding. Kidding. You know, there's actually a verse. Did you know there's a verse in the Bible about this? And I've never applied this to my life. I never really understood or never wanted to understand it maybe. But uh, uh, just joking about that. Uh, if you're single, here's the first one right here. Just apply married people's guidelines in your relationships with married people. In other words, treat the married people in your life like you're going to want somebody to treat your married person once you get married. That's Everybody with me on that? And I, I just can tell you this. When you get married, single person, when you get married, you don't want single cute sweet thing giggling around your husband saying, let's have coffee or let's have dinner. You, you won't want that. So you don't be that person. And just aside, single people, I, I don't travel alone with married people. I don't have lunch or coffee with, alone with married people. I don't counsel or confide in uh, 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 alone with married people. And some of you single people, you're doing this. And, and when, when he sits down, he just pours out his heart to you. You feel so valued. You feel so cherished that that married guy is, is, is sharing all this stuff with you. And listen to me, you're in trouble. You are moving towards something that you have no business being a part of. Number two, single people, no sleepovers. <laughs> Eight-year-olds have sleepovers. Adults don't have sleepovers. Just decide my boyfriend, my girlfriend never spends the night, ever. Come on. But Craig, it was really late. You don't understand. Come on. Just decide no sleepovers. You say, but Craig, he slept in the living room on the couch. I don't have to know all the particulars. The point of a guardrail is to keep you from getting close to the thing that you are going to regret for the rest of your life. So you just decide, hey, listen, here's a guardrail for me in, in my single life. No sleepovers. And I know there's people today that look at me and go, Craig, you just don't understand. You are getting so old. You don't understand how our culture is. Time out. I do understand way more than you think I understand, or I wouldn't be up here talking about this today. Amen? Amen. Last one, number three. Stay with me. This is huge, and this is a tough one. But if you catch this, this is really important. Number three, the third area for single people, guardrail. If in the dating scene that you're a part of, if date has become equivalent to sex, in other words, if you get to the point in your dating that you're thinking, if nothing happens by the end of the date, well, that really wasn't a date, then here's what you need to do. You got to come to the point in your single life where you just take a break. You, you get your calendar out and you go one year from today and you go, okay, I'm going to take one year and I'm going to put an X on the calendar next year between now and when I get to that point, zero relationships dating relationships in my life because you need a year to renew your mind. You need a, a year for God to renew your heart. You, you got to reset in your dating life. All right, married people, come on back into the conversation. This is how what I'm talking about today with these guardrails. This is how you have an amazing marriage. Hear me on this. 
I, I don't even think there's anything left in the notes. So don't look at your notes, just look up here. One of the most powerful fuels for intimacy in a marriage, one of the things that drives this thing that we want the most, which is this closeness between me and my spouse, that intimacy, that closeness that God created for you to have, one of the most powerful fuels in intimacy is being exclusive. And when your spouse looks at you and they have this feeling inside that they are the only one in your eyes, when your spouse believes that they're the only one, that is a powerful thing to end intimacy in your relationship with your spouse. And you know where that begins? It begins by having guardrails. It begins by having personal standards of behavior. So what would you expect your heavenly father to look at you today, the one who created intimacy, the, the one that created this idea of a man and a woman coming together and having, creating marriage, creating intimacy? I mean, come on. It was, it was God who created this in the first place. Amen? Amen. And, and, and I, I don't want to go over the edge with this, but I do want to say this, that, that, that God created this concept of, of, of intimacy, and he created the, the idea of sex. In fact, if sex is fire, God brought the matches. <laughs> Yay, God! <laughs> and when you learn to honor God with your body, the reward is, here's the payoff, that God will honor you with a relationship where there's all this intimacy, which is the way that we were designed to live. But if you're, if you're going to get there, man, you got to establish some guardrails in your life. You got to establish some, hey, here's some personal standards of behavior. This is the way I'm going to live my life. Because when I'm married, I want to have that intimacy with my spouse. I want to have that closeness. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you that way back in the garden, Genesis, all the way back in the first of Genesis, you created this intimacy between a man and a wife. And I thank you for that, Heavenly Father. What a wonderful thing that is. And I know that today is really tough to listen to. I, I, I get that. But Heavenly Father, would you give us the wisdom to know what to do with, where, with, with what we've heard? And it, it hits so many in so many different places. For married people, Lord, I, I, I pray that they would set up some guardrails so that other person in our marriage, they would know, they would know that they were the only person for us. I pray for single people. I pray that they would guard this area of their life and they would live with guardrails in their life so they, they wouldn't fall off the edge and have to live with regrets. So Lord, however, however this hits us today, would you give us the wisdom to know what to do with what we've heard? And then Lord, would you give us the courage that on that drive home or whenever we're alone with our spouse that we just stop and we say, hey, let's just take a few minutes and talk about this. Give us the courage to live out these guardrails in our lives. And Lord, for those great marriages that happen, Lord, we just lift them up and we just say, thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing in this church and our families. Thank you for the single people that are following you with all of their hearts. And we, we lift those people up today and say thank you for them. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening.